Welcome to Climate News Weekly. Today, I am joined by our regular co-host, Julio Friedman, as well as Canary Media reporter, Julian Spector. First, my conversation with Julio. Julio, good to see you. Coming to you live from Texas. It's great to be here. Awesome. So we mentioned last week that you were planning to go to Sarah Week, where you have been now for several days, I believe. So tell us, how has Sarah Week been? What's the layout? And what are the conversations that you are you are hearing at this at this annual event? Right. So S&P Global puts on this annual Apex Energy event every March. And it's always held in two buildings, one of which is the executive and main stage presence. And the other is across the sky bridge in the George R. Brown Convention Center. And that's where the Agora is. The Agora is where all of the you know, innovative clean tech companies are. That's where they have a climate hub, a carbon hub, and a hydrogen hub. And so on one side, you have literally like the old guard in the old guard building. And the other side, you have the, the new guard and the transition mavens and a thing. And they're connected, in fact, by the media, which is on the second floor of the scuttlebox. The, the metaphors are rich. Indeed. So tell us about the highlights and the, the sort of main themes in these two buildings. And let's start maybe with legacy energy, fossil energy. What were the main ideas? What were the main conversations that you picked up on in that building? Right. So in general, in the executive main stage building in the Hilton, a lot of the conversation was about how you got to keep having fossil fuels. The CEO of Aramco, Abin uh, Ben Nasser was there. He sort of led that charge, but a lot of the executives were saying something similar, not just the oil and gas executives like Tim Worth of Chevron or Darren Woods of ExxonMobil, but also people like Pedro Prasaro from Edison Electric Institute and others. Mm -hmm. Their message was, I think, tempered a bit by people like Secretary Granholm or Bill Gates, who were there talking about the range of opportunity in the energy transition and the good stuff they're seeing. But also there were people like Joe Manchin, who was there saying, sorry, we're using a lot of fossil fuel for a long time. And the profits reflect that and strategies reflect that. So that crew was very much feeling strength and feeling comfortable asserting that strength. And as someone who's observed this industry for, for a while, what do you make of that message? Why are they out there pounding that message in the way that they are? Because it seems like it's much more aggressively sort of argued now by the industry than maybe it had been or has been. I think in part that is backlash to the backlash, if you will. In part, they're feeling like they've been put upon relentlessly without reason. And when they have invested in energy transition, their stocks suffer. And when they produce oil, they don't. I think that is part of it. And of course, oil and gas demand keeps rising. Electricity demand is rising. So they're like saying, hey, we are providing you guys energy and you still need us. I also think that part of that is bravado. I, I don't want to overstate this. Right. All of these people still have energy transition plans. They are still making investments uh, in hydrogen and carbon capture, in renewables, in nuclear even. They're still making those other investments. They have strategies. Last year, they were emphasizing the energy transition strategies. This year, they're emphasizing the uh, traditional energy supplies. Yeah. After Amin Nasser, CEO of Aramco, uh, made his remarks, Secretary Granham did stand up and, and to quote her, she said, that is one opinion she said of his prediction for the long-term use. And she said, you know, there have been other studies that suggest the opposite, that oil and gas demand and fossil demand will peak by 2030. So she's sort of bringing in, as you say, that the, the, the counter, counter position there. Also interesting, you know, Exxon has spent about $5 billion on its carbon sequestration subsidiaries and efforts. And CEO Darren Woods made some remarks that he is not at all confident that carbon capture and storage and hydrogen will really build a sufficient business and raise concerns around sort of the viability of this idea that, you know, an Exxon or these majors can sort of shift to this other portfolio of things, right, in the energy transition. And I suppose that's just a, you know, got to be a reflection of the profits that they're raking in and, and saying, wow, you know, this works, we want to keep doing this. And the other stuff, we're less keen on because it makes us less money. And that is one opinion, to quote Secretary Granholm. Yeah. That was not Vicki Holub's opinion. Vicki Holub is like, no, we're going full tilt onto this and we're doing great, which they are. 
Who's Vicky Holub? Vicky Holub is the CEO of Occidental Petroleum. So, so what did she say? Yeah, no, she was very much crowing their accomplishments in alternative energy, mostly in thinking about carbon capture, but also in hydrogen, also zero carbon electricity, also renewables. They're doing quite a bit and they're doing quite a bit around the world and their stock price reflects that. Yeah. Other companies like Total have a broader portfolio of activities and have made some big announcements as well. So like people often think of the industry, like the industry is one monolithic thing. There's state oil companies, there's the majors, there's the minors, and even within the majors, there's a broad set of strategies, perspectives, and so forth. Yeah. Still the gestalt at Sarah Week, the overriding feeling was, hey, fossil fuels are here and you still need them. So, you know, get off your high horse. I will add though, the overarching sensibility that I got from both sides of the discussion from the Agora and the main stage, from the transition folks and, and the traditional energy, everyone is talking about working together. The thing I heard over and over again was we need partnerships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do we make partnerships? That is a radical departure from the prior years. Yeah. The prior years, everyone was like, I'm going to be king of the hill, or you should work with me, or yeah, we'll talk about partnering, but it's just me and you, and I'm going to advantage myself. Totally different sense now. Interesting. Today's conversation has been, we need each other. How do we partner? And partnership is electricity companies partnering with oil and gas companies, partnering with technology companies. It is government partnering with civil society, partnering with startups. There was a lot of talk about climate justice. There was a lot of talk about permitting reform. Everybody realizes that this is harder than they thought. Everybody realizes is more expensive than they thought. Everyone realized it's slower than they thought. So instead of this, we know what we're doing, plow forward kind of stuff, there was a great deal, a great deal of conversation about how do we work together. I was super pleased to hear all that. Anything else that was notable from the Agora, from the other side, the other sort of group of, of industries present? Oh, yes. So uh, in general... This conference is an oil and gas conference. When people talk about it as an energy conference. There was nuclear, there was hydrogen, there were all these things. But generally, the, CERA is an oil and gas conference. What I found noteworthy, the top conversation, the thing everyone was talking about, clean electricity. There's a broad recognition that solar and wind have gone a long way and have helped, but they're starting to hit their limits. That was the sense within the building. Yeah. And specifically, people were saying the prices are not going down, contrary to what academicians are saying. In fact, costs are going up for, for these. Also, we can't get the 24-7 hourly dispatchable stuff. Even when we pay extra money for batteries, it doesn't deliver everything we need. It helps. It costs more. But it doesn't actually solve everything. So starting to people are starting to understand is just the scale and magnitude of this challenge. So a lot of the tech companies were over in the Agora. Microsoft, Amazon, they had very large presences. They were talking about their AI tools and how they help with climate and all this stuff. But there was a recognition that Amazon builds one data farm, that's 500 megawatts of power. In contrast, like when New York State just announced their great big wind development, that's 130 megawatts of power. You need three of those to power one server farm. Right, right. So it's interesting. It's a good segue to two other stories that we have this week. One is a story in the Times that came out. This is actually a little over a week old, but, but we've seen this story in a few other places through different lenses. But this idea of a new surge in power across the United States as a threat to U.S. climate goals. And some of the predictions here include that uh, peak demand is projected to grow across the country by 38,000 megawatts or 38 gigawatts or roughly 19, you know, large, you know, light water nuclear reactors worth of, of power demand over the next five years, according to one consultancy. That's a huge amount of additional generation that we'll need to be doing in order to power, you know, the needs of the energy transition and also the needs of computing that are growing. So the theme in these stories is that in order to supply this, we have to keep open a lot of these legacy power producing assets, including coal and, and, and build more gas-fired plants. 
What is your view on that, Julio? Do you think that that's accurate? Do we think that we don't really know or inaccurate? I mean, how do you metabolize that story? Right. So it's basically right. I would put it that way. Basically right. So when people say we're going to electrify everything, you can't just magic up the electricity. Right. And we've talked on this show many times about the need for transmission, the need for permitting of these projects. We've the problems with the interconnect queue. All of that is real, but even that grossly undersells how hard this is. We are seeing this massive surge in demand and none of it is for energy transition. It's just surge in demand. For the past 20 years, there's been flat load. There's been flat demand. And so the fact that there's a sudden inflection was predicted but people are now grappling with just how hard it is. And so when you add load, even when you add renewables, when you add solar and you add wind and you add them with batteries, you're also adding natural gas. That's the reality of how the grid works. And why is that? It's necessary to stabilize the frequency. It's necessary to maintain the sureness of the system. It's about the reliability. Power companies see reliability as their first job. They really do. Reliability is number one, price is number two, carbon is number three. And that's how they're graded every day. People go to their wall, they turn on the lights. If it's not there, they grade their utilities really badly. And so we are discovering this thing. And if we want to start adding lots of green hydrogen or lots of industrial electrification of steel mills and all of these things, holy cats, we need way, way, way more electricity than we have. We're talking about three times or four times the growth. And if we're going to make CO2 fuels, we need way more electricity. If we're going to make uh, carbon-free fertilizer, we need way more electricity. And we haven't even started that yet, and we're already hitting the wall. So there's one more story that we wanted to cover this week, appearing in Bloomberg on March 17th by Aaron Clark. This story is about an innovative approach to essentially hack weather satellite data to quantify methane leaks. So... Essentially, there is a network of satellites that sits about 22,000 miles above the Earth's surface, and we use these satellites to capture all kinds of data related to our weather patterns and storms, and we've been doing this for a long time. Scientists out of Harvard University from the Atmospheric Chemistry Modeling Group at Harvard first proposed the concept in 2022, and I'll quote Daniel Verone, who is a research associate with that group, and he says, GOES, which is the methodology, can detect brief releases that other satellites miss, and it can trace detached plumes back to their sources, so actually pinpointing where the methane is released along a particular pipeline, for example. It can also quantify total release mass and duration rather than just instantaneous estimates of emissions rate. So again, Cutting methane release is one of the cheapest ways to drive down temperatures in the short term. So it's something that is incredibly urgent. And it's one of a number of breakthroughs in really a series of breakthroughs from this group of scientists affiliated with Harvard, the Polytechnic University of Valencia in Spain, and the United Nations International Methane Emissions Observatory that have really expanded researchers' ability to spot leaks using a wide variety of satellites, which weren't originally designed for that purpose. To quote an analyst with Bloomberg NEF, the innovative technique shows the accelerating pace at which detection and quantification of methane releases is happening, and most importantly, highlights the potential to use existing technologies and satellites already deployed to improve detection and quantification and tackle the temporal variability of methane emissions. So this is a pretty cool story, and it's indicative of a trend that we've covered before on this show, which is our rapidly improving capacity to track methane to then be able to do something about it. Really cool story. So thanks, Julie. I think we'll wrap up here, but great to discuss these stories with you as always. Great to see you. As Julio and I were discussing, rising electricity demand is putting a strain on both the grid and energy storage systems. To dive deeper into this topic, we invited Canary Media reporter Julian Spector to discuss some of the insights in his latest article, which covers developments in battery storage. Here's that conversation. Julian Spector from Canary Media, welcome back to Climate News Weekly. It's great to have you on again. Thank you for making time. Oh, glad to be here. Last time I was, the, there was an earthquake. So I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping to better better luck this time. Yeah, that would really be quite quite odd. So hopefully not. 
So you have been getting into battery storage and including that in your beat at Canary Media. T tell us about that. We've been hearing about battery storage for a while. We know the forecast is that we'll be seeing a lot more of it. Like in your reporting on the ground, talking to energy developers and all the different people that you talk to, is that true? What are you seeing? Oh yeah. So this year is just going to be crazy for grid batteries. And for background, I, I've been covering that beat going back to like 2016 at, at Green Tech Media at the time. And you know, ev everyone knew batteries were going to be important if we're having more solar and wind and you can't control when those produce. So you got, you got to store the clean energy for, for the sort of vision of an efficient clean energy system. But eight years ago, no one was building very much and certainly not very big. And it's just incredible how far we've come where this year batteries are going to be the second largest type of power plant that we're installing this year, like solar is by far the biggest as far as megawatt capacity. But for the first time, you know, batteries are the next biggest. So, so we're wow. going to install more megawatts of batteries than new gas plants this year, more megawatts than wind plants this year, and actually more, more than gas and wind put together. What's driving that? So it's a combination of, you know, the battery economics, like of the, the physical lithium ion batteries that getting cheaper and, and, and more effective over time as the, the global production scales up. I think there's also a real kind of industry learning element where in the early days, not many people had shown they could make money on a battery project. So then the people with the money to finance these things were, were hanging back because they wanted to know they'd get a good return on, on their investment. And so it's, it, we've seen a couple kind of pioneering developers go into new markets and build a thing they think is going to be good and then make a lot of money. And then you see this wave of, of followers coming in. And so actually one of the biggest stories has been Texas, which had basically no grid battery market to speak of four years ago, five years ago, you know, not a, not a lot of climate policies the way like California passed all these policies to incentivize energy storage. And now Texas this year is going to be the biggest battery market in the country. They're going wow. to install even more than California. And, you know, the most free market of our energy market since the ERCOT, uh, you know, anyone can kind of come in and build their thing and bid into the market. And if they do it well, they make money. You don't have to wait for years kind of getting a utility to to sign a contract with you like you, you might in, in other places. So, so that's kind of indicative that the technology itself has gotten highly competitive. It's huge in, in ERCOT now in a way that it, it never was before. Mm -hmm. Cool. Your story just came out titled Utah Developer Quadruples Battery Storage to Meet New Electricity Demand. It's a very kind of interesting story and kind of encapsulates, you know, where we are with the deployment of battery storage in this country. T tell us just very briefly, what, what are the key bullets, bullet points in this story? Yeah. So, you know, normally when you're developing a power plant, you, you have a design in mind and get the land and get the equipment and you go and build it and it's all sort of laid out and, and preordained. And so this was a really unusual situation where this developer called R plus they're based in, in Utah. Also they had been doing batteries and solar for a while and, and even some pumped hydro storage, which is, which is cool. But they had a project in Eastern Utah that they, they had a contract with the utility Rocky Mountain Power. And then something's been happening in the last few months as the utility industry is realizing electricity demand is actually going way up in the next few years, which hasn't happened for the last couple of decades, actually, because, you know, efficiency, LED light bulbs, all, all these forces were kind of keeping our electricity demand pretty flat suddenly with AI and the, all this new data centers and, and all this, to some extent, the return of American manufacturing to American shores and the early movements towards electrifying vehicles and everything, the, the expectation is in the next five years, we're going to need a lot more electricity than we have thought we would need. So the utility went to our plus and said, actually, we know you're, you're working on that battery. Is it possible for you to just like give us way more clean electricity from that? And so the developer went back and looked at it and was able to quadruple the size of the battery. And it, this is in the 
megawatt hour terms. So like the size of the tank, basically of how much power can go in. So it's supposed to be 400 megawatt hours and they quadrupled that to, to the 1600 uh, megawatt hours at this project that, that also has solar attached. So yeah. that's just like a huge scale up, very, very, very unusual to do late in the game because they're actually, they're expecting to start constructing it like in the next few months. One of the enabling factors for R plus was the recent infusion of $460 million from an investor, Sandbrook Capital, private equity investor. And when you see private equity investors get involved, you know that they usually don't take technology risk. They're usually putting mm -hmm. money behind sort of proven technologies that have been deployed before at scale before. So th that capital undoubtedly plays a part in them being able to afford to, to, you know, and be able to raise debt against or however they finance the billion dollar capital spend that will be required for this enhanced project. And so it's interesting to see that that's where we are with batteries. Like, we're at the point where risk averse funding is finding their way to these projects and enabling kind of another level of scale up. Yeah, no, that's totally true because yeah, these are big projects now. I mean, this they're expecting it'll cost a billion dollars to, to actually go and build this. That means you need more capital coming in beforehand to like fund all the work to get it ready. You're right. You just weren't seeing that interest from private equity. Like, five years ago, certainly not 10 years ago. And it's still, you know, new relative to them funding like wind and solar projects, but it, it's definitely an encouraging sign for the market that you're seeing more and more of these, these investors come in and say, okay, battery storage, we get it. We're not scared of it. And, and we understand it's got a, a valuable role to play here. Well, Julian, it's great to have you as always. Thank you for your perspective and thanks for your great work tracking the energy transition for Canary Media. Really appreciate you, you being on today. Well, thanks for asking about, you know, one of my favorite things to nerd out on. That's it for this week on Climate News Weekly. See you next week.